talking about this? I know you're talking about it and I'm talking about it, but why is the world asleep to this concept of disease being diet driven? And my second question before you answer that is, do we have a diet driven virus going on right now? Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So, well, the second um, question, I'll let me just tackle that one first. So, I think that the reason the virus is scary is diet driven. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Mindy in the house. All right. <laughs> I appreciate that. The carnivore diet. Because of the heat. Honestly, you've really touched my heart. So Fast Like a Girl, it's ready for pre-order now. I hope this book changes your life the way the information has changed hundreds of thousands of women that have applied it. From the bottom of my heart, enjoy and let's get healthy together. I'll tell you one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on and it was one phrase, other than I can't wait to pick your mind, um, but one phrase that you said or somebody said about you or a phrase that you use called a diet driven disease. Oh, yeah. And why are we not talking about this? I know you're talking about it and I'm talking about it, but why is the world asleep to this concept of disease being diet driven? And my second question before you answer that is do we have a diet driven virus going on right now? Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So, well, the second um, question, I'll let me just tackle that one first. So, I think that the reason the virus is scary is diet driven. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, otherwise, when they, I don't know if you remember, but when this first came out, they were saying, oh, well, this is going to be kind of like a bad flu, or at least a lot of doctors were saying that. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. Dr. Drew Pinsky, I don't know if you, follow him or if maybe on your followers do, he said that and he's like, yeah, it's going to be a bad flu. And we had our reasons for it. You know, they were very, very valid, valid reasons. And then of course, when you have uh, 30 year old folks who seem healthy dropping dead, well, they didn't really drop dead. They got really sick and they were in the hospital mm -hmm. a long time and then they would die, um, you know, horribly after suffering for a long time, unfortunately, um, from this virus, then that just makes people who said, well, it, I heard somebody say it was a flu. It makes them angry, but um, the the this anger and our emotions are running so high about this. The fear is um, just so prominent in all this that we're not being scientific or logical. And to me, the science is just so clear. Look, folks, it's it's an infection. It's uh, an infection that can be serious because it can cause a pneumonia, just like the flu. So that's where that comparison comes from. And it's contagious very much like the flu, as opposed to the way measles is hyper contagious. Measles is one of the most contagious viruses there is. Um, and you know, also as opposed to like tuberculosis, which is not a very contagious disease. So it's similar in a lot of ways to the flu. But the difference is, of course, our immune systems haven't seen this before. We don't get vaccinations for it. And we don't have a Tamiflu or anything that can help once you get it. But beyond that, um, it's uh, very similar to the flu. And it's true that the flu actually, when it kills people, it kills people by very similar mechanisms to the coronavirus. But what's making it so deadly is, the, is our diet. I mean, we do have every year young people who could have not died from the flu. Every year we have that happening too. And, and, and they die. But because we haven't seen anything like the coronavirus, we don't have any immunity to it. It's just, it's a harder infection for our bodies to fight off, that's all. So more people are getting sicker, but we wouldn't be so devastatingly killed by, by it if it weren't for the seed oils that just make our immune system, um, you know, our immune system becomes an inflammation generator when we have seed oils in our body. And there's a lot of other details that people are finding out about this virus that were not known. Like for one thing, now we know that it attacks the um, lining of the blood vessels. There's cells called endothelial cells that line our blood vessels. So when you have a, 
virus that attacks your blood vessels, that's very, very, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. For most people with the coronavirus, it doesn't get that far into our bodies. It just kind of stays in our upper respiratory system. Maybe I'll go into our lungs. It doesn't become like a systemic infection where it can attack our blood vessels. But when that happens, that's almost like game over. I mean, for most people, they're going to, if they survive, they will survive after a very difficult course in, in the intensive care unit and they may not be the same again. Why does that happen? Inflammation. Otherwise, we would just be sick for a while mm -hmm. and then we'd get better but we wouldn't have all these blood clots and um, fluid in our lungs and the strokes and the heart attacks and the you know, other neurologic problems, that is what is killing people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so when this first happened, I was sort of in awe of how the pandemic was unfolding across the world. And I dove into the science to try to understand like where my brain went for the first month is why is everybody so immune compromised? I absolutely agree that you've got this new virus that is our immune systems haven't seen, but we're dealing with that every year. We have new viruses our immune systems haven't seen and some are more virulent than others. But why aren't we talking about why the world is immune compromised? Right. And to me, it's like what you just said, it comes back to diet. And when I dove into the research, I really saw that metabolic syndrome was at the root of everybody's immune compromised uh, place of what their, how their bodies were uh, handling this virus. So do you feel like that's true, that the root of an immune compromised situation is metabolic syndrome? Absolutely. Because it, and the root of metabolic syndrome is the seed oils, right? Seed oils right. cause metabolic syndrome. So it's kind of like it works backwards and forwards, right? It, it causes metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is associated or is caused by, in my opinion, uh, largely the seed oils, right? It's the seed oils and sugar and carbohydrates that are refined are, are not you know, the greatest to overconsume, obviously, but, um, but they're addictive when your bodies are so full of seed oils and it's a metabolic addiction. It's not just a pleasure addiction. So mm. that's why seed oils are public enemy number one, because they can drive all of this by themselves. Mm. They cause people to overconsume sugar and carbs in a way that we wouldn't be doing if it weren't for these things, mm -hmm. for these seed oils that affect the way they affect our appetites, yeah. our metabolism, our energy, and everything else. Yeah, and I, I absolutely agree. And I want to dive into the seed oils so that people can really understand this. I think this is another reason why I'm excited to have this conversation with you. And I want I want our listeners to like understand that there is a something at play here with our health that nobody seems to be talking about. And I do not understand when we have our politicians and our doctors standing up saying mask. Why are we not saying and avoid the seed oils and avoid the sugar? Like, why is the medical community, as a medical doctor, I, I'm hoping you're going to shed some light on this for me. Why is the medical community not talking about diet and what we need to do to keep ourselves immune strong? We don't, the medical community can't talk intelligently about diet. And we, we, because we don't learn the truth. You know, we don't learn this stuff about seed oils in medical school. I didn't learn it. I, I didn't know it. I had to discover all this science on my own on the island of Hawaii before Google, right? It was, it right. was a lot oh, of wow. work. Where'd you, did you get a book? Did you go to the library? How'd you learn it? I did actually. I went to, <laughs> um, I went to uh, a library and uh, I went actually to a bookstore, a medical bookstore. I had to fl fly to another island and I got a book that's on a shelf behind me here. It's a huge, uh, it's probably five pound biochemistry book with uh, like 2000 pages. Love and I, it. I pretty much read it co cover to cover because I needed to understand stuff that I hadn't been taught in medical school. And, um, you know, I mean, and that's the reason we just, we don't learn, we don't learn the absolute fundamental truth about what's making most of us sick. We learn lies. I mean, the stuff that we do learn in medical school is uh, saturated fat makes you fat, cholesterol clogs your arteries, mm -hmm. salt causes hypertension. And, and those three things are very dangerous lies. They are lies that blind us to the reality of what's actually happening right in front of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, to the extent that like 
doctors don't even look at the ingredients. I mean, I didn't do this. I didn't look at the yeah. ingredients of salad dressing before I bought it or frozen dinners. I didn't know that, uh, I didn't know what seed oils were. I didn't know what a canola was. I just knew, right. well, if the saturated fat thing is low and it's not butter and there's no lard in it, it's got to be better than the other, you know, it's got to be all right, right? The fat, yep. whatever that is, it's got to be all right. Yeah. Just don't learn. It's not. Taught. Yeah. Are you taught, are you taught nutrition at all? Do you have nutrition classes or that's the nutrition you're taught what you just mentioned? Yeah. So we learn quite a lot about nutrition. It's not in the form of a nutrition class though. It's in the form of cell uh, physiology mm -hmm. Great. And, and physiology itself. Like yeah. we learn it, if you include in the definition of nutrition beyond just diet, but also what happens to these nutrients once we eat them we learn how they get incorporated into our bodies and you know i thought that was a fascinating area of of of, of science really it's like how do you turn food into you and so you know we don't learn something that's we don't learn like it as nutrition science though but mm -hmm. when you think about it if you understand the definition of nutrition science is the science of understanding how to, to do you, how your body grows out of the nutrients that you get. If you include the growth part, we learn so much. It's just that we just don't put it in context. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we, we don't, we do learn that you need some polyunsaturated fatty acid, but we don't learn that you, that more than enough can actually be toxic. We don't learn mm -hmm. that. That is key. Mm -hmm. That is the key thing yep. that's missing from a, a pretty much every education. I've not seen any textbooks it, from any, whether it's a dietitian. Dietitians really don't learn anything different about the diet part of it than what doctors do. Mm -hmm. um, you yep. know, they, they learn a lot more detail about how special uh, people with special dietary needs, how to feed them and how to calculate mm -hmm. stuff really accurately. But in terms of like the the way to nourish a body through food, it's just the standard stuff. It's still, you know, you want to have like lean chicken and, um, you know, steamed broccoli with olive oil on it and no salt. Um, yeah. You know, so, um, yeah. Yeah. So every, yeah. everyone's not educated very well about nutrition anymore. I think back before World War II, we did a much better job. Mm. What was happening then? Why did we do better in world, before World War II? World War II uh, was uh, a turning point in humanity's relationship with the natural world. We, we kind of lost interest in it, you know, and we were fascinated with antibiotics, with the atom bomb, with technology, better living through chemistry. Dow Industrials said, you know, uh, DDT is good for me. It's chemicals, mm. right? Tang. I don't know if you remember those commercials from the 70s. I do remember Tang. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's like, it was powdered orange flavored sugar water, right? Yeah. But it was sold as this is better than orange juice. This is what the astronauts, you know, jet off into outer space with, right? Better living through chemistry. Forget about nature or the planet or, you know, what we've been doing, what had we been doing to nourish the human body for thousands of years before you know, World War II. Forget about all that stuff. What we've got now is better. And we, you know, people bought that story hook, line, and sinker because it was, it was sold to us by professional liars, right? <laughs> That's what Madison Avenue is sort of, right? They're professional. Yep. They're marketers. So, yep. so nutrition became marketing. N nutrition science became just really a way to sell more frozen TV dinners and to sell the stuff that we grow now in this country, which currently is primarily corn, soy, wheat, canola, and a few other crops. Yeah. So nutrition science is no longer really a science. It's really purely marketing. And I, I've called it like the original fake news nutrition <laughs> science. Yeah, so <laughs> true. So we have, this is one of the things that has like, blown my mind and baffled me is we've got chronic disease on the rise. We've got, you know, metabolic syndrome. Like I read an article recently that only 12% of Americans are metabolically fit. We've got a virus that has everybody immune compromised. We have doctors that are not really educated in nutrition and, and don't use nutrition as a first line of defense. 
And we've got a food industry that is more interested in keeping us addicted to food and coming back to more food and isn't really interested in the health of food. How, how do we, where do we go from here? How do we move <laughs> from this place to a place of hope and possibility? Well, one step at a time. And we have to know where we're headed. I think that's the most important thing. Um, and so that's actually what Deep Nutrition was more about that than fat burn fix because, um, it, you know, I earlier I was saying that we don't pay attention any here now in the society to what people used to do to nourish the human body. Um, and uh, we, but we can, we can, we need to understand that. That's very, very important. And what the, it's very uh, conceptually, very easy to figure out how, how to do that because we have cookbooks. Cookbooks are really the original nutrition science mm. uh, textbooks, really, because that's what people used to eat before we had all these wacko chronic diseases. That's what we, what we were, what were we doing? Like what, what, what is eating? What is cuisine? What is a diet? What, do, what is traditional food? It's how to extract nutrition from the environment you live in, like the maximum amount of nutrition, because people figured out a long time ago that there's a way to do that. And it, makes you healthy and it, your life depends on it, right? It, what you eat determines your health and determines so much about your child's health. Um, I uh, discovered, I didn't discover him, but like I, I learned about the, the man whose research really changed my life the most was Weston Price. And mm. I'm sure you know mm. about him. Yeah. Oh yeah. Incredible. And he said the same thing somewhere in his book. He said something so poetic the way he wrote. He was somewhere in like Switzerland, surrounded by beautiful snowy mountains, and it was just a beautiful landscape. And he was talking about how the children he saw, like their faces were so symmetrical and perfectly balanced and, and physically beautiful, and their teeth, of course, were straight and pearly white. He, was he said something like, it's almost as if our physiology reflects the landscape that we learn to live in harmony with. And that is it. That's it. That's the truth. That's what we used to do. That's what we need to do. And that's where I'd like to get going, to get us going to. Um, Love it. There's a lot of work before that can happen. But, right. But, you know, before we, we can trick our bodies into um, believing that our landscape is beautiful. If we get the most high quality food that we can afford, you know, like, like animals that were pastured or even better, um, on regenerative agricultural farms where the soil, yes. you know, maximally fortified, um, we, that's, that's like the way that we can, uh, kind of trick our bodies into believing that the world is still as pristine as it used to be. And, um, you know, we don't have buildings all over the place and, uh, you know, that there's still nature, but we have yes. to trick ourselves. That's what we're doing is we're tricking ourselves into believing that the world is the way we need it still. Yes. And yeah. we have to reach all over the world. I mean, the, the, the bad news is we have to reach all over the world. The good news is we can do that. <laughs> right. Right. I do see that there's this real trend of people going back to how our ancestors lived because it's almost like we hit this tipping point where modern living, modern eating, modern convenience is making us sicker and sicker. Right. I, came I came across in my research last week a term called intermittent living. And they were saying that if you go back and you look at our ancestors, we didn't have light. We couldn't keep our temperature the same and comfortable all the time. We didn't have food all the time. And we, a lot of our ancestors were going up and down high um, elevation and in and out of high elevation. So you go and you look at all the trends right now, intermittent fasting, uh, intermittent cold plunging, uh, intermittent uh, the circadian rhythm fasting, like all these things are just trying to, like, I love this idea to trick our bodies to believe we're not living in the modern world anymore. And I, it's, it's amazing. So, I, so when it comes to food, again, I come up against these hurdles with my resetter um, tr uh, group where people can't afford the good food. They don't know what the good food is. It's like the food has become this, this thing you need a PhD in to be able to do it right 
to be healthy. So how do I help people go back to simplicity with food? And, and, well, and think of the person that knows nothing. Right. Well, you can start with breakfast, right? This breakfast is the most important meal of the day, not to screw up, right? So if, you're, if you don't need a breakfast, you don't need to have a big breakfast. You just need to have enough in your mind of what you're going to eat when you do get hungry so you don't reach for junk. But if you want to start with a healthy breakfast, there's so many simple, easy options. What I do personally, and I've done it for like 20 almost years now, is I just have a ton of milk and cream with a little bit of coffee and it's grass fed raw. You know, I was going to ask you, yeah. <laughs> if you're a Weston price follower, it <laughs> has to be exactly, raw, right? <laughs> yeah. It just tastes so different and so much better, I think. So, I mean, I, oh, I would do it for the taste, it, you yeah. know, but, um, so that's my favorite breakfast, but another super simple breakfast. And I mean, we just build, build, it's just like you're teaching somebody to read, right? You start with the alphabet. So you just start with basic, easy foods that you don't have mm. to do a lot of cooking for. So I, another thing, if uh, people don't like dairy, can't do dairy, a lot of people can't do dairy. Um, I'll have them get Ezekiel sprouted grain uh, bread, toast it, uh, slice up an avocado, smush it on there, put a little salt on there. If you want to get fancy, you could put some coconut flakes on there. Boom, that's your breakfast. Not yeah. a lot harder and why, than... Why Ezekiel bread? Okay, great question. First of all, it's sprouted. Sprouted grains are a lot more nutritious um, and just better for us than than whole like than whole grains that have been pulverized into a flour. Um, because sprouting awakens the enzymes in the seeds and uses up some of the empty calorie starches, creates new nutrients that weren't there, and it also leaves the seed intact so that there's this structure, this micro structure, microscopic structure that helps it be released very slowly from our digestive system into our bloodstream. So we don't get a blood sugar spike and an insulin spike. So, and um, that particular brand is better actually than some other brands that people have tried because um, I use uh, continuous glucometers on a lot of my folks, my patients. Uh, yeah. And so we can see the yep, Love those. <laughs> oh, interesting. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's, I never thought of it about testing different food brands. We found um, here local to us, we found an ancient grain bakery and it was like, Oh my gosh, the greatest moment of my life. And they do ferment, <laughs> fermented ancient grains that are sprouted. It's like, whoa, like they took every concept and put it together and it's really tasty. And it's, you yeah. know, it is really, the difference is incredible when you go back to some of these old styles that, and ways that we used to cook is, is unbelievable. But the challenge that, again, I see with my, in my community is how do we make this affordable for people? Cause I don't know the price difference between Ezekiel bread and wonder bread. That's the only one I can think of, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but I'm sure there's a big price difference. What do you, what do you say to the person that's like, great, I'd love to eat Ezekiel, but it's so much more expensive. Most of those folks are in a position where they want to lose weight. Most of those folks are in a position where they, mm need to lose weight because they've been eating more calories per day. They've just been eating more. So we get you down to where you don't eat so much. You save money yes. from, just from that, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. So that's, that's one big thing. And, and the other thing is when you get your energy back, you can do more, right? So you, you don't need you. It's like you're buying time, which is how much does that mm. work? But the, so, so yeah, I, I know that there are a lot of folks who are living, you know, w single moms with like three kids. Um, I just tell them, you know, do what you can start with whatever it is that you can afford and definitely don't waste your money on junk food. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, cause yeah. yeah. And you know, like, yeah, we're say, big fasting fan. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. There go, you go, go right? Uh, that doesn't cost anything. But I mean, a lot of folks, they, they, don't, right. they don't know what to cook. So they, they just don't buy anything other than like junk food, right? So by which I literally mean junk food, like chips and popcorn and soda and candy bars, because that's the only thing that they know how to, you know, peel and unwrap. That's the level. But so then you just help them, okay, well, do you like this? And you say, instead of buying this candy bar, buy, you know, 
I don't know, a bag of carrots or, you know, something, just one, one thing at a time. And, and some, I've worked with folks for a year or two uh, to take mm-hmm. them on this long journey from, you know, frozen Marie calendars and kind of absolute junk food diet, lots of soda uh, to, to, I mean, unbelievably healthy. And a lot of it is, is reducing the number of meals per day and, you know, hugely reducing the number of calories. It just saves money. <laughs> right. Well, and that's one of the things I say in, um, to our community is like, you know, if you start to look at shortening your eating window and you and just do something like intermittent fasting, you've now taken one meal out of the day. So let's say that meal cost you $4. Um, now could you maybe apply that to buying avocado oil over canola oil? Like, could you use that money or your trip to Starbucks? You know, could you start to get your, wean yourself off your venti frappuccino and not everybody's doing that, but, and then put that money towards the food that is more, is, is better serves you. And I think it, it's just takes, it takes us all to kind of shift our perspective because like to your point, we've been just taught convenience, convenience, and we go according to our taste buds. Yeah, and well, yeah. When I when I get really granular with folks, it turns out that there's a lot of going out for takeout, and, mm. and that's just not the that you don't save money when you do that, right? I mean, yep. I know some things it, it's very inexpensive compared compared to a sit down restaurant, but if you get away from the takeout mentality uh, and just do a tiny bit of planning. Um, then you start to move in that healthier direction. So, you know, yeah. but it, it, it does help to know where you want to go. And a lot of folks do get lost and start to feel like, you know, they need that PhD in food science and, and just giving, you know, like, I'm sure you do this, but simple lists of here's some real foods that are real healthy, that are high in healthy fats that are kind of like really a great place to start, especially for breakfast, because like I say, breakfast is the uh, most important meal of the day not to screw up. And we do when we start with a high carb breakfast, especially if it's a high glycemic carb breakfast. Mm-hmm. Um, but, it, you know, so converse of that, it, what that translates to is a high fat breakfast is a great healthy breakfast. Mm-hmm. You don't really need a lot of other macros. Our, our hormones are all totally wired for us to run on fat in the morning because we would be running on our own body fat, right? So right. we don't need a lot of protein. We don't need a lot of carbs. We could just do pure fat. I mean, like my breakfast is so much calories for probably 300 calories from cream and 100 from the milk. Yeah. So, which so it, it, Tons of fat. Which is the calorie concept is a whack on the side of the head for people too, is like to get away from the calorie uh, counting. We've been really t- uh, preaching macros, like let's look at the quality of the food, not let's not look at the calorie of the food. Um, and the, from the research I can see, there's never been really um, anything backing up the calorie in, calorie out for weight loss that that hasn't. And Jason Fung brought this to, in the obesity code, really brought this to everybody's attention. So. When, when we look at obesity, what do you think is more important? If I'm like sitting here and I have 40 pounds to lose and I, my diet, I've been doing everything we're talking about. I eat all day. I, I eat out all the time. I'm not really thinking about my food. What do you think is a more important first step to give up sugar or to change my oils? Oils, hands down. It's, uh, that is the public enemy number one. And in the fat burn fix, I talk about how that drives appetite dysregulation, which takes, I I think the calorie conversation is more complicated than, you know, either calories do matter or they don't matter. There's calories that derange our body's mechanisms for regulating appetite and energy level. And in the fat burn fix, I talk about the, the, those mechanisms and how vegetable oil disrupts every single last one, um, including the most fundamental unit of it, which is the, the mitochondria. Um, now, sugar plays a role in, in sweets um, and, you know, the high uh, glycemic carbs. Did I say that right? High or low? Yeah, it's high glycemic carbs. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, they disrupt our insulin. You know, they, they make you shoot out too much insulin, which disrupts your hormones. Um, but the, uh, the, that's, and they're addicting. So they uh, disrupt another, there's four systems. One is your mitochondria, the other is your hormones. Then we got body fat, and then the, the fourth system that regulates your, your energy and your weight for you is, um, 
the appetite centers in your brain. So sugar being addicting kind of disrupts the appetite centers and disrupts some of the hormone mechanisms, but vegetable oil disrupts all of them, mm. all four. Mm. Um, and, and it disrupts the, um, the, the ability of your appetite regulating system to recognize that you even have body fat. Interesting. So you're always hungry and you're tired, right? So it, it, it's, this is where leptin resistance come from, comes from is the seed oils. Um, and leptin resistance means that leptin cannot give you energy. That's one of the things that leptin is supposed to do when um, the uh, ventromedial hypothalamus in, in the appetite regulating center of your brain, which is deep in your brain by your pituitary gland, kind of behind your nose, about four inches. Um, when that thing senses leptin from healthy body fat, then it energizes the sympathetic nervous system and gives you kind of a, I want to just get up and move feeling. And that's how you don't have to cal calculate calories. Once oh, you get, once you get there, you don't have to calculate calories because your body takes care of it for you. That body does it perfectly, perfectly. But before then, I think calories you know, you have to have some concept, uh, especially, especially of the high fat foods, because even though they're super healthy, it's so easy to overdo it with nuts. I mean, my God, macadamia nuts, that roasted macadamia nuts. I could probably do 500 calories of those in, you know, five minutes. And, <laughs> and I do have to watch because I don't get to exercise as much as I want to. My body wants to exercise, but I don't get to for reasons that have to do with, you know, my immune system and my lifestyle. But, um, so I really have to, I can't, if I notice if I have more than around 1400 calories, uh, 1500, maybe then I do start gaining weight. So to mm -hmm. me, I do buy into the calories in calories out, but it, it's, it's more complicated than that. It's also about your energy level and how much are you moving. And that's mm -hmm. what's rarely measured and um, why the current evidence on calories in, calories out is so weak. There's a massive difference in somebody's response to eat at overeating. Um, there was a really interesting study that they, they overfed folks by something, uh, I don't know, like 1300 calories or something. And one group actually became less active after that. And another group became massively more active and basically made up for all the calories that they overate. And unless you're tracking activity on, on like an incredibly, you know, minute level with, you have to do it in a, in a closed calorimity room, you know, a closed oxygen room. You can't do that very easily. And um, so most of the evidence that we have on calories is, is flawed because it does not really track how much people want to get up and move. And that comes, that comes from how does your body respond to this flood of these seed oils? How does you, mm -hmm. how does your appetite regulation system react? Are you, is it resilient to that? Does it, do you still have energy in spite of this, um, you know, inflammation in the appetite center or, or are you somebody that you just feel tired all the time and you don't have the kind of get up and go that you did when you were a kid and you attribute it wrongly to aging? Right. Yes. So true. And that so when I, well, so when I eat, should I feel energized after I eat or, or is it natural to feel sleepy after you eat? The reason it's natural to feel sleepy after you eat. And the reason is because right after you eat, first of all, most of the nutrients are not in your body yet. They've got to be broken down. How does that happen? Lots of fluid, mm. lots of fluid. Where does the fluid come from? Your bloodstream. That means less blood for your brain. So the body, it's totally natural to feel tired after a giant Thanksgiving meal or any big dinner or any big meal because you're now you're digesting, you're in digestion mode. I mean, think of the, the lions on the Serengeti, right? After they um, you know, devour a gazelle or whatever, they roll over on their backs and they just fall asleep with their paws like this, you know? And that's because that's natural. That's while we're digesting, we need to allocate uh, the fluid to the digestive system. There's like a couple of liters that go in there when you have a meal with a lot of meat in it and salt. Um, that's a couple fewer liters from not just your bloodstream, but also your interstitial fluid and everything. A lot of fluid shifts happening. It just makes you tired and we're supposed to rest. We, why, why do we need to be active? We just presumably hunted something down right. to eat. So 
we can rest now, right? Yeah. So it's, it's all nature just makes so much sense when you think about it in like the terms of nature. What would nature want? Mm-hmm. What, you know, and the crazy thing that no one talks about is that true hunger is hunger in the best sense. It's an energizing experience. You hunger, you're excited to do things, right? So when you when you've been laying around, you haven't been eating very much, the state of hunger is supposed to be an energizing state. And one of the proofs of this is, well, when, when, we, are, when we haven't eaten for a while, we're burning our body fat. What are we releasing for our brain? Ketones. Ketones are some of the most energizing brain fuel there is. So yep. you, you have the mental energy to say, gee, I... I wonder where I could go to find some food or, you know, I wonder in today's world what I could make my family for dinner after a busy day at work. So you're not like, oh my God, let's just take the, do takeout. I don't have the energy for this. Yeah. And that energy part of the equation is the part that has not been talked about. That is the missing piece of this whole conversation because it. it all boils down to energy. And that's what I talk about in the latest book. Oh, I love it. I lo- did you, do you talk about that in the fat burn fix or do yes. we have it? Oh, okay. That, I love that. I love that idea because I do believe that we've lost the art of eating healthy and there's a, so many factors that go into it. But I love this idea that when the ketones go up, you're hungry, you're more alert, you can make better meals. Uh, that was so beautifully said. But let's talk about the seed oils just so we can kind of bring people into the conversation of like, because I find that oils are so misunderstood. Like most people, if we went out onto the street and started interviewing people about what they, what was, how sugar played out in the body, most people would say, oh, sugar's bad. But when you start talking oils, people don't realize that they're good oils and there are bad oils. So talk about when you say seed oils, which specific oils are you meaning? Seed oils are, there's three C's, three S's, and then two miscellaneous. Um, so it's like A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y. So the three C's are corn, canola, cotton seed. The S's are soy, sunflower, safflower. And then we've got um, rice bran and grape seed. So the first the six, the C's and S's, those are the ones that we really, I want people to memorize because those are the ones you're going to find and ingredients in the grocery store when you're going shopping. Yep. Um, the rice bran and the grape seed, those are mostly used by the restaurant industry at this point. So it's, it's uh, you know, just even the sit down restaurants, we're talking about like even fancy stuff when I was in Napa and Napa Valley, um, they all use that stuff because it's cheap. It's a byproduct of other industries. Um, so those are the seed oils and none of them could have existed before the industrial era. So, um, you know, they're, they're new kids on the scene here. They are not traditional oils. Um, and so the good oils are the traditional ones, the, the kind that you know what it is that they came from. Olive oil, most people know what olive looks like. Coconut, peanut, mm. um, you know, av- avocado now that actually wasn't a traditional oil, but avocados are so high in fat that um, you can extract the oil from them without damaging it. And the fat is very stable. And I have a lot of resources on this on my website. Um, right. But this, this is kind of like the most important topic. And, it's, and it is like the third rail of nutrition. Um, so much so that uh, I was on Real Time with Bill Maher back in May. Um, awesome. it, uh, yeah, it was awesome. He was a great host because he was very generous and kind of helped me, even though I was like nerves. I was a bundle of nerves. Um, <laughs> he helped me make that's a you know, big platform. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, and, but he helped me make the key points. And um, so, but you know, uh, as as if by magic, the um, three weeks later, this guy from Tufts, um, like School of Nutrition and Metabolism comes back to reiterate the party line, um, which is, uh, of course, saturated fat is bad. We need to eat more fruits and vegetables and we need to try to not eat so much. And we got it. We're lazy. We got to exercise more. I mean, he didn't call people lazy, but it was, that's the message that, um, I heard Mm -hmm. from him is that it's your fault. Um, and I, and, and so in other words, he's a figurehead that is allowed that I don't know how he got on Bill Maher because 
in the whole, like I've been a fan of him for a long time. I have never seen a doctor on talking about nutrition. He talks about it, but what a coincidence that this other person comes on as if to correct me three weeks after me because you go to Tuff's website and they say, um, there's 10 foods that we got to like, that could change American health. And one of them is, you know, some we need to eat more of, some we need to eat less of. Of course, we need to eat more fruit, right? We need more sugar. We're not getting enough. Right. <laughs> um, and, um, and the one that we, another one that we need to eat more of, vegetable oil, right on top. Oh. More. What? He has, either he has no idea that we are eating a hundred times more than we used to and more PUFA by a factor of 10 or 20 than our bodies can handle. That's the, that's the reason these vegetable oils are bad. It's the polyunsaturated, PUFA stands for polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, but um, either he has no idea that that's, we're, we're already eating so much, it's, it's beyond ridiculous and beyond what our bodies can handle. It's toxic now. These levels are toxic. Or he's just a, a figurehead and he's paid to say this stuff and he doesn't care what the truth mm-hmm. is, or he knows he's lying. I don't know. But that's what um, doctors, you know, like myself and people like you, we're up against that. That yep. is the propaganda machine that is on purpose lying to people. On, I mean, I, the machine is on purpose lying. I don't know whether this particular doctor that was on is, is knowingly lying, but you know, it's, it, the, the truth should be obvious to anyone who really studies metabolism. Um, so, you know, none of these experts at Harvard, there's, a, there's another guy just like this expert at every institution. There's one famously at, at Yale that uh, goes by the name of Katz, and he's a pro-vegan. Um, and mm. so he's always in the news talking about how, you know, meat is harming the environment and uh, we really should just be eating more oranges. Like yeah. <laughs> so what, why do you, you know, you had an article, one of your, uh, on your website that was very popular and it, the title of it, Harvard is something along the lines of Harvard gets it wrong <laughs> and how people, Harvard and Yale, those platforms, um, not just the medical schools, but now they're like WebMD where they've got these nutritional platforms and um, what they are like you said, they are advocating for things that are not proven by the new science on nutrition. And I, I look at that, I get frustrated with it because people go, well, Harvard, Yale, you know, Tufts, and then they just buy the expert because we have so much admiration for these higher learning institutions. I, my sister graduated magna cum laude from Princeton, got a PhD at Yale, and she quotes Harvard's medical uh, site all the time to me. Mm. And I worry that we don't have resources for people to get the true information because you said, like you said, there's so much money that can be poured into these um, institutions and platforms that keep people asleep. What, give us some tools, like obviously your book is awesome and we will put a link in there so that people can understand fats, but uh, Weston Price, you talked about that and how, but how do we wake up and how do we tap into accurate information if we've got this machine working against us? Well, I think we have to ask ourselves, like, you know, how are you interested? Are am I really interested in waking up, or do I just want to be told what to do this morning for breakfast? Um, and and if if it's the second category, you're going to be buffeted around like a beach ball on a windy day on a, a wavy beach. You're just going to be from one minute to the next. You're, so you have to s- decide for yourself if this is something you really care about and think deeply about what's happening in the world. Just looking around, you know, where what do you believe in? Do you think that nature works pretty well um, in terms of healing and growth and creating life? Or do you think that, for example, um, infant formula is more perfect than breast milk? Mm, And remember, these are the same people that said that, right? Uh, This is the people from Harvard and Yale and Tufts. They were telling women after giving birth, after creating a new life in their belly, they were saying, forget about those things on your chest. 
just mm-hmm. bind them up and put ice in them because we want to give your babies this powder that is more perfect than breast milk. These are the same people. So yeah. just, you know, we just need to enlighten ourselves. It's kind of like, we got to wake up. You know, we've yeah. had this, this cloud of, of, um, you know, Madison Avenue wants to give us this cloud. It's not like we're being, but, but we we have to wake up and take personal responsibility and start using this thing in here. And, uh, you know, it gives us this thing in our heads that tells us what makes sense and what doesn't when we use it. But if we don't use it and we just go for trends and listen to authority, then we're going to be constantly changing. And that is that. nowhere more true than nutrition science. Oh, I love that. I, so I have a YouTube channel where we teach a lot on fasting. I bring the science on fasting over there. And one of the, my mantras to, to people, in fact, I just did a video this morning on an article that came out showing that for, out of uh, UC San Francisco, a um, uh, doctor did some research on intermittent fasting, two-year study, and came out of it and said that it may not be the key to weight loss. And so I brought the article to my YouTube followers and I was like, this is what you need to do when you see a sensational new headline like that. Let's unpack how this guy did this study. And my constant mantra is think for yourself, think for yourself. Don't think like me. Don't think like Dr. Kate. Don't think like take the information in and think for yourself because we've all gone asleep. And in that going to sleep, we now have diet-driven diseases and diet-driven immune compromised. So I love the way you said that. If you want to stay asleep, go ahead, but know you'll be batted around like a beach ball. But if you want to wake up, you're going to have to educate yourself. One of the books that changed my vision was Undoctored. Have you read Undoctored? I don't think so, but I've heard of it. Definitely a lot about it. Yes. I, 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 I thought it actually was a uh, documentary too. Oh, maybe he did. It was Wheat Belly Guy, Dr. Davis, William oh, Davis. Oh. oh, okay. It's a great book. And basically he said that we now live in this information age where we can get more information on our own health condition that when we walk into our doctor's office, we may know more than our doctor knows on like diet around thyroid and we need to honor that and doctors need to be aware of that that the that there are people waking up and taking their health back and and i just my prayer is that the the medical profession will join that all doctors will join in helping people with lifestyle is that is that do you think that's ever possible that we can get everybody to use lifestyle first as a mechanism for health as someone who had to escape the medical system after learning the power of food because I could not I couldn't talk about it effectively in the system we would have to change the system i mean the, the, the system is keeping people in the system it's wonderfully mm. efficient at that and part of the problem is that when even though i learned all this kind of amazing stuff i was still beholden to um, seeing people rapid fire. You can't talk to anybody about diet in 15 minutes, but if you see people any less frequently than that, you lose your job. Mm. Mm. So (laughs) true. So, I mean, it's a matter of the doctor's kind of life and death too, in in the current system. The only hope is, uh, well, what what I'm doing now is, is an example of the way that other doctors could, um, operate. I'm working where my boss is not a hospital system that you know wants to get people in and out of the hospital for procedures. My boss is just, it's a company uh, that has, mm. employs human beings and they hired me to keep the human beings as healthy as possible. And so I'm not, I don't have to do like complicated, um, you know, whatever it's the, an acronym is now with the, the legal government things that doctors have to waste so much time on. And I don't have to do complicated billing. I don't have to do anything that I don't need to do to take care of people and make them healthy. Love um, it. it. Yeah. And I don't have to rush either. I can catch, they can call me. I, I give people my cell phone and it's just like, I'm a doctor in a community. Um, and it's, that's the way it used to be. And yep. that's the way it should be get back to like, I lived in Hawaii for 11 years and, um, the plantations 
which were, you know, the sugarcane plantations mostly, um, they had a doctor because that employer wanted to get, keep people healthy. Right. And it was kind of like a little perk for working on the plantation. So that made sense. That doctor could do what he thought was best. No one else was looking over his shoulder. And if what he did didn't work, well, then the people would notice. <laughs> they would talk about it. Um, and, and so it's just a much more natural kind of way of, of um, approaching healthcare. And of course, that would fix everything. So of course, no one's talking about that. Uh, last night right. we had the presidential <laughs> debates and that, that's not an option. <laughs> 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 I was paying very close attention to what they were going to say on big pharma and on uh, on food. And I'm like, at the end, I'm like, I don't even know what anybody said. I think I'll just go back to my little bubble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, that was pretty bad. Wait, so let's talk about Hawaii for a second, because um, one thing that I hope our listeners are getting out of this is that the system's broken, so you're going to need to take on some new strategies if you want out of the system. And one of those strategies you're saying is get off the harmful oils, and I absolutely agree with you. What else you studied? What, what was it called? Ethnobotany. I want to know what that is, for starters, in Hawaii. And you, what other culinary habits can we add in so that we create a healthy body? Right. So ethnobotany is the study of uh, how other ethnicities, I guess, use plants, right? So, Love it. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's super cool. I, I um, have a cynical view of it because unfortunately, most of what it turns into is rich white guys go and uh, say, oh, this is a plant that you've been using for, for what now? Oh, oh, like, oh, something to do with liver. Oh, great. Let's see if we can take all of it out of your forest so you guys don't have it anymore and, and, you know, isolate some compound from it and sell it and patent it as a, as a drug. That's what happened with one of the hepatitis C drugs. So, um, Crazy. yeah, I mean, so that's, I mean, it's a great concept and, and there's a lot of knowledge that, you know, it's wonderful for traditional cultures to, uh, you know, use plants as their kind of pharmacy, but, but also just like, healthy plants, right? To like, you know, okay, well, you can use this as a spice. You can use this. This is kind of a good famine food. This um, helps with infections. And oh, I love it. Noni that um, they make this paste out of noni and it's really rank, but you just slap it on your skin if you've got an abscess and it's somehow like helps it cure without antibiotics. It's amazing. So there's really, really cool stuff. But, um, you know, it's it's not like that's where they went with it to use the noni. They went to the chemical in there that you could isolate and patent and make mm. a blockbuster hepatitis C drug out of. Yeah. Sad. Fascinating. Fascinating. There's so much about the plant world that we could benefit from if it wasn't, if it wasn't used that way. So true. But you'd ask something about um, what else can we add to our diet? Yeah, please tell us. So um, this uh, is in the book, Deep Nutrition. There's four things that my husband and I discovered were strategies that people from every culture used to extract that nutrition from their environment. And those four strategies, we call the four pillars of world cuisine. So this was all, this was food, right? It wasn't using plants as medicine. It was just using food to nourish, which is a different, which is the most fundamental strategy for health. It's, it's If you don't do that first- right. Your other things aren't going to work as well. So um, there's fresh food, which a lot of people do, but a lot of people don't realize that our milk isn't fresh, right? Uh, right? It's pasteurized. Yeah. So it's nutritious is when it's fresh. Um, you want to have, of course, fresh, you know, plants also, you know, sometimes they have lots of antioxidants in them and um, heat destroys nutrition. So that's why you want to know how to cook an egg properly so that you don't destroy all the nutrients in the yolk, for example. So we talk about that. Um, then there's fermented and sprouted food, which is a way of using nature to enhance the nutrition in the raw food. It also preserves it nicely. So fermentation uh, preserves it, you know, yogurt and cheese and stuff, and even salami traditionally is fermented um, and sprouted, which is the sprouted brain bread sort of scenario. And you want to sprout your seeds before you, um, cook, uh, sprout your beans and, you know, if you can, before you cook with them. Um, and then we have uh, meat on the bone, which was when I was working with the Los Angeles Lakers, this was everybody's favorite because it 
uh, it brings out just so much flavor in meat to, to cook it low and slow and you use all the juices and the fat and you get this amazing stuff that helps your skin and your bones that come from the joint material and the collagen when you cook with that Love stuff. Um, and then the last thing is uh, organ meats because those are the original superfoods because like liver, for example, has just so much more um, bioavailable B vitamins than muscle meat, right? If we're just mm. only eating the muscle meat, we're, we're getting a lot of great protein, but we're missing out on a lot of the other spectrum of nutrients that we need. And every organ in the body has like a sliver of the the, the spectrum of the full rainbow of nutrients. So, you know, kidneys have some benefit. The stomach has some benefit. People used to eat all of it because to do otherwise was ridiculous. I mean, why not? If you can eat it, eat it, right? It would be wasteful and stupid. And um, so, you know, people grew up eating that stuff. And when you grow up eating something, you want it again and you crave it. Um, and this was like that organ meats are kind of like my, my kind of, I guess, you know, people see me almost as like, that's what she's all about is eat more organs because um, it was the first thing to fall by the wayside when our respect for tradition um, disappeared. Organ meats are some of the most perishable, right? You mm. get your liver, if you don't do your liver, if you don't cook it just right, it's gross. <laughs> and the same is true for like all the other potential organs. So, but those yeah. are the four strategies. I love those. And what I find so interesting in all the people that I've interviewed, the organ meats keep showing up, fermented foods keep showing up. Like you, like you take Dr. Paul Saladino, we interviewed him on the carnivore diet, and he was really about uh, nose to tail, eat the whole, the whole animal. Uh, Dr. Bill Schindler is an anthropologist. He calls himself a food anthropologist, and he's all about fermenting. Uh, I brought on uh, an anxiety diet, anti-anxiety diet specialist, and she said, I can't heal anxiety without getting people to eat organ meats. It, wow. So I feel like wow. you just brought together, like everybody I'd interviewed, you like brought together all of their, of their wisdom in your four foundations. That was beautiful. I, before I ask you my last several questions, I have to ask you what the proper way to cook an egg is. You got me intrigued on that. <laughs> you want to cook the white because it's actually more bioavailable when you cook the white and you can leave the yolk runny because all of the wonderful uh, fat soluble nutrients are uh, more bioavailable when they are not cooked because heat destroys nutrition. So you can do sunny side up, you can poach it, you can do soft boiled, but that's the healthiest way. Ah, uh, that's the way I do it. Awesome. And with the and with the meat, I assume if meat on the bone, you want to like grab that bone and chew on it. Yeah, yeah, and get it like all the the tissue fiber that actually have flavor. Um, you know, there's like a sweetness to it. Uh, from that, the, the, the ribs, when you get your barbecue mm. ribs, right? There's that thing you can peel off. That's actually really good for you. Amazing. Yeah. So don't give it to my dog. I should clean the bone first and then give it to my dog. Well, you don't have, you could give it to your dog because your dog deserves nutrition too, this but you true. could also save all those bones and boil it to make bone stock because that extracts even more nutrients. You get the hydrolyzed collagen. Mm. And if there's any cartilage left, you get the glycosaminoglycans and stuff that turns gelatinous and wiggly. And a lot of people think it's fat, but it's actually gelatin. And it's a very special compound that wakes up the cells in your skin that make your skin that, that like support the collagen of your skin. It wakes up the cells in your joints that support the collagen of your joints. Collagen is the magical youth uh, molecule in your yep. body. Yep. And if, you're, if you've got cells that make a lot of collagen, it's good for every part of your body. It holds everything together. Your hair too, nails too. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. Okay. Here are my last five questions and, th and these have been customized for you. We like to ask all of our guests five um, uh, specific questions. Okay. Right. My first one, my first one to you, if you could go into every medical school and teach one class, put one course back into medical schools, what would that course be? Well, I would be talking about PUFAs and what they do to mitochondria and to promote inflammation and how that is the root of the vast majority of the diseases of Western civilization, inflammation. 
is the root. And these seed oils are the most effective way to promote inflammation in your body, more effective than cigarette smoking. Wow. Wow. Are there good seed oils, by the way? Are they like, what do you think of black cumin and coriander and other seed oils? So that's not an industrial seed oil. That is a kind mm. of like a medicinal or perhaps a culinary seed oil. And those are fine. Those are great because the way that they are extracted includes, it doesn't damage the very fragile polyunsaturated fatty acids and turn them into toxins. And it includes the um, minerals and all the stabilizing antioxidants that the nature puts in the seed. So, and flax right. too. Yeah. Flax is another very common, people ask me about that all the time. Well, you don't cook with it. You, you use it, you know, either as a, as a supplement or you can drizzle it on dressing or something like for flavor, but um, it's not something to cook with and it's not extracted in an industrial setting where you destroy everything that was good about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Okay. You're talking to a new set of new parents. You're a family physician. You're talking uh, to a set of new parents. And what advice would you give them for keeping their child healthy as they start to raise this new baby? I would remind them that they're in charge <laughs> and to act like it. <laughs> 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 on all levels. Uh, yeah, yeah, especially at the dinner table. And, you know, just once you start giving kids special dinners, your life is fractured into a thousand splinters <laughs> that you can, ne it's going to be so hard to repair. Don't let that happen. Yeah. Everybody oh my gosh. We had, food. <laughs> yeah, we had a situation where a friend came over when my kids were little and she said, my son only eats cheese pizza. And we had like a buffet. It was like a buffet dinner. And I was like, are you, are you kidding me? Like I have the best food sitting on this table and your son only eats cheese pizza. No, no, no that's not going to work. Right. So, Who's in charge here? Yeah, right. Who's that's in charge. Beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Okay. If you were Dr. Fauci right now, what advice would you be giving Americans? Um, geez. Wow. I would say, um, listen to Dr. Kate. <laughs> Look her up. Google her. She knows what she's talking about. <laughs> I love it. I love it. But I should say, okay, I do know what I'm talking about when it comes to fast, but when it comes to children, I don't have any. So it's easy for me to say, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, the reality is very different than the theory, but the theory is the way I grew up, we all ate dinner together. If parents used to be able to do it, we could do it then, we could do it now. Yeah. Yeah. I always say that we're the best parent before we have children. We yeah. have a lot of, we have great parenting advice until we get a couple. So, okay. Five habits that you do every day to prevent disease that you just would never give up on. Sure. Um, I make sleep a priority. Um, I carve out time in the day to be active. Um, I uh, don't snack. I don't snack. There's no such thing as a healthy snack. I make sure to get plenty of salt because when you only eat one meal a day most days, like, like I do, and like a lot of folks in my same boat do where we don't, we're not that active, we have to kind of not eat a whole lot of food. Uh, it's very hard to get enough salt, so you really got to add it in. And, mm. um, and I, uh, what else do I do? Is there one more thing? Well, I guess it's, um, I never say no to a food I haven't tried before because mm. uh, I always unless it has a poofa in it yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> I don't consider that food <laughs> okay think, good and we put yeah that. that's good <laughs> that doesn't count yeah yeah <laughs> but exactly. I love that what meal do you is breakfast your one meal a day is dinner do you change your one meal a day around so dinner is really my main meal I mean I have the coffee and cream at breakfast um mm -hmm. But it, then I don't, eat, I don't have anything until, yeah. until dinner. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I get the bulk of all of my nutrients. I have to get them all in the one meal. Yeah, that's kind of how I do it too. It's really convenient. And once you yeah. get yourself trained, you can accomplish a lot in the day by not having to think about food. <laughs> and I tell you what I love about it the most is I basically, I get to pig out. Right. Yes. I, I, you yes. know, I eat till I, I feel really full and uh, I just don't have a lot of willpower. So I don't think I could stop eating before I felt full. Yes. So if I skip lunch, it's in the bank. Works for me.
Yeah, I had a friend one time say to me, gosh, I watch how you eat and I have no idea how you stay so thin. And I'm like, well, you're not watching what I'm not doing. Like when I'm not eating, I'm not eating and I'm going long periods without it. So yeah, but when I feast, I'm like, I'm all in. And I, I'm like you, I want good quality food and I want the experience of it and family around and good conversation and good wine. Like I'm, I'm all in on my meal. So Okay, last question. If you had one message for the world that you could get across to everybody's brain, what would that one message be? Your body is a miracle and please treat it like the miracle that it is. It can heal you. It's not your doctor who's going to do it. It's you. Yeah. Just let oh. it. Oh. Love it. I love it. That is my message too. It's like, I just want to give people the power back. Like believe in yourself again. You're incredible. We, you just haven't been taught how incredible you are. So, oh my gosh, I love this. This was a great conversation and I, I'm watching your two books behind you. Um, I've got to get them both. So where do people find you? Where do they get your books? How do they engage in your information? drkate.com is my website and it's drcate.com. And I'll tell you, I have links to uh, where you can buy the books. Um, but if you go through me, you, I give you a little more detail about how to decide which one to start with. And then also it helps me with a, like probably a 10th of a penny of a affiliate thing with Amazon too, because I'm an Amazon awesome. for my own books. That's, that's like all the old products that I have in my that's whole awesome. supplements. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. That's great. So we will put links in, in, um, on the notes of this podcast so people can engage in your information. So this was so delightful. And I just want to thank you for how you're showing up in the world and the incredible good that you're doing. We need more voices screaming from the rooftops. We need more people teaching others how to do health and yours is a powerful one. So thank you so much. So grateful well, for you. Thank you. Thank you for the platform and I love the energy that you bring. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure your patients just find you so inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I, I'm just, you know, I had my own chronic problem, uh, disease issues when I was 30 years ago when I, and I just had the medical profession just continually let me down. And then I found diet. And ever since then, I just wanted to teach others to do the same kind of like you. So yeah, same story. I mean, it wasn't until that's what opened my eyes. Right, that because I had a problem myself, and you know, and on the medical system had no answers, so yep. that's where it started for me. Yeah, I love it. Thank you, Dr. Kate. So grateful for you. <laughs> Thank you.